Bibles with me to 1 Thessalonians in chapter number 4. And I want to commence reading in verse number 13. 1 Thessalonians in chapter number 4. Commencing in verse 13. That would be right before 2 Thessalonians. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. But if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself, for the Lord himself, shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. Thank you, you may be seated. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God shall stand forever. I want you to see something in the text that will happen all of a sudden. We will be caught up to meet the Lord in the air all of a sudden. December 7th, 1941, in the words of President Franklin D. Roosevelt, is a day that will live in infamy. On a warm Sunday morning, the Imperial Japanese Navy Air Service launched a surprise preemptive military strike against the naval base at Pearl Harbor in Honolulu, Hawaii. The attack led to the United States' formal entry into World War II on the next day. The attack crippled or destroyed nearly 20 American ships and more than 300 airplanes. Most importantly, 2,335 soldiers were killed along with 68 civilians and over 1,100 people wounded. The United States never saw it coming because it happened all of a sudden. On a Tuesday morning, September 11, 2001, a series of four coordinated terrorist attacks by the Islamic terrorist group Al-Qaeda was launched against the United States. American Airlines Flight 11 and United Airlines Flight 175 slammed into the World Trade Center in Manhattan. American Airlines Flight 77 destroyed a section of the Pentagon in Arlington County, Virginia. And United Airlines Flight 93 intended to target the White House or the U.S. Capitol but was taken down by passengers aboard the flight in Stony Creek Township near Shanksville, Pennsylvania. 
between 8.46 and 10.28 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, September 11th, 2001, 2,996 people were killed with over 6,000 injured, with additional people dying from respiratory diseases even to this day at the cost of over $10 billion to infrastructure and property damage in New York, Washington, and Pennsylvania, and the United States never saw it coming because it happened all of a sudden. The first coming of the Lord Jesus Christ was announced by the angel Gabriel, not only to his parents but to shepherds keeping watch over their flock by night. His coming, his first coming was announced, but his second coming will be all of a sudden. When he came the first time, he was born in a manger. But when he comes the second time, he will sit on the throne. When he came the first time, Pilate judged him. But when he comes the second time, he will judge Pilate. When he came the first time, they saw him in a manger. But when he comes the second time, every knee shall bow. And every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. The first coming of the Lord Jesus Christ into the world was a time of amazing grace, a time of wonderful miracles, a time of the outpouring of God's love and care for his children. Thank God for all that Jesus accomplished when he came the first time. But in Acts chapter 1, uh, the Bible says he went away to heaven and he's coming back for his church and while he is gone, we have a responsibility to preach the gospel. Brothers and sisters, he left us, and he left us with a promise that he's coming back again. In John chapter 14, when they were despondent over his leaving them, he said, let not your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. For in my Father's house, are many mansions, and if it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go, not meaning I may or may not go, but since I'm going, I will come again and receive you unto myself that where I am, there you will be also. Regardless of what the world says, regardless of what unbelievers have determined to be a lie, the Lord Jesus is coming back. The passage under consideration this morning shares with us some events that will take place when Jesus comes back for his people. Uh, brothers and sisters, these events give us believers hope. These events cause us to rejoice and reminds us that our Lord is coming back for us and we need to be ready for no man knows the day nor the hour when the Son of Man shall come. For like Paul, Pearl Harbor and like September 11th, the Bible says through the Apostle Paul, when he comes again, it will be all of a sudden. There will be, brothers and sisters, according to the scripture in 1 Thessalonians 4, there will be a resurrection. Uh, the Thessalonians uh, knew that Jesus was coming back, but they were confused about the parousia, or the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. That, that doctrine had confused them. Uh, they thought that believers had to be alive at the coming of the Lord Jesus, or somehow they would miss the resurrection or the rapture. They also believed that their departed loved ones were, were gone forever. 
They had died and that was just the end of them. But Paul writes to them to set the record straight and to get us to understand that because of Christ's resurrection, we are guaranteed our own resurrection. Because he rose from the dead, you and I also one day will rise from the dead. And if we are still alive when he comes, because it could be tonight, we will be caught up together to meet the Lord in the air. Paul, Paul uses a phrase or a word here that is, that is difficult to translate in English from the Greek. Uh, but Paul says, I would not have you to be ignorant uh, concerning them which are asleep. Uh, he uses what is called uh, in the English uh, lightities. It's a difficult word to translate from the Greek. But, but it, it, it means something like um, an ironic understatement in which an affirmative is expressed by the negative of its contrary. Let me run that by you one more time. Uh, it's an ironic understatement in which an affirmative is expressed by the negative of its contrary. But I would not have you to be ignorant. Paul is saying, we do not wish for you to be uninformed. Because if you are uninformed, you are easily influenced. I wish I had my 730 cry. If you are uninformed, if you are ignorant, it's easy for you to be influenced. Do not be guilty, Paul says, of being ignorant. Do not be guilty of credulity. Credulity is believing without examination. And many of us this morning shout on an unexamined faith. Because worship must be preceded by word. I wish I had one or two more witnesses. You can't shout in worship if you're uninformed in the word. Because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And if you don't know the word, it's hard to have a good time in the worship. Uh, I, I would not have you to be ignorant. Be careful of credulity. Be careful of believing without examination. Be careful of shouting on an unexamined faith. Uh, you, you can't inherit religion from your parents. Uh, you can't borrow Christ from your friends. You must know the word for yourself or else worship becomes a routine. Jim Jones was able to capture hundreds of people and led them astray to their own death because they believed without examination. Paul says, I would not have you to be ignorant. I would not have you uninformed. Let me fill you in on some information that you're lacking. Hear me, brothers and sisters. Hope is rooted in doctrine. Worship is inextricably bound to word. Paul says, I don't want you to be ignorant concerning a certain situation. Uh, the situation is concerning them which are asleep. Uh, asleep. He's talking about the dead. Asleep is a euphemism for death. But it's a euphemism for death only for believers. Uh, because when unbelievers die, they just dead. But when Christians die, we fall asleep. Fall asleep in terms of only Christ can wake us up. Uh, let, me, let, me, let, me, let me help you to shout the next time you go to a funeral. 
Uh, let me help you to give God praise the next time you go to somebody's funeral. A cemetery, the word cemetery means sleeping place. Uh, when you go to bury somebody who loves God and lay them in the ground, you are laying them in a sleeping place. They're not dead, they're just sleeping. Because our physical body and our soul goes to decay, but our spirit goes to be with God because to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Uh, we know that if this earthly house of this tabernacle is dissolved, we have another building. A house, not, I wish I had a Bible reader, not made with hands, but eternal in the heavens. When a Christian dies, we just fall asleep. Paul said, I would not have you to be ignorant concerning them which are asleep. That's your sorrow, not like those who have no hope. Because verse 14 tells us that God will bring the dead with Christ, with him, when he comes again. For we shall not prevent them who are asleep. The dead in Christ shall rise first. I think I told you about my mother. My mother said all kinds of things that I think about now that she's gone and it just rings in my heart and in my ears. My mother said, she had a saying for everything, and she, she always had a funny way of looking at life. And uh, my mother, before she passed, about two or three months before she passed, she said, um, don't bury your daddy on top of me. Now, they're in the same cemetery. But she said, don't bury him on top of me. Matter of fact, I don't want nobody on top of me. She said, because when the trumpet sounds, uh, your daddy might not be going where I'm going. <laughs> she said, I, I want to get up, and I don't want that Negro on top of me. Uh, this, this, this matter of sleeping and, and this sleeping place is temporary for the believer. Uh, we go to rest when we die. And we fall asleep when we die, just like um, uh, Lazarus fell asleep. Y you remember that Jesus was, was away from Bethany, and Mary and Martha sent word to him that the one that he loved was sick. And Jesus delayed coming, and, and when he finally got there, Mary and Martha said, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Jesus said, you're going to see him again, Martha. Martha said, I know I'm going to see him at the resurrection at the last day. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believes in me, though he be dead, yet shall he live. And he that lives and believes in me shall never die. But, but I want you to see what happened when he went to Lazarus' grave. He called Lazarus by his name and said Lazarus come forth somebody ought to help me preach it Jesus went to the grave he went to the sleeping place and he did not just say come forth because had he just said come forth Adam would have got up Moses would have gotten up David and Jeremiah Ezekiel and Daniel Jose, Lazarus Come for and listen when he calls me by my name, I will answer because I'll be somewhere listening for my name. I'm, 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 I'm trying to hurry right here, uh, but 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 when 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 Christians die. Their name is called. When sinners die, their number is up. Because 
Satan has numbered everything in the world system. Uh, AT&T doesn't know your name. They know your telephone number. Your mailman don't care nothing about your name. He knows your address and your zip code number. Uh, the, the social security people don't know your name. There are thousands of people in this country with your name. They know you by your social security number. The Department of Motor Vehicles don't know you by your name. There are thousands of people in Texas with your name. They know you by your driver's license number. Because everything that belongs to the devil is numbered. But everything or everybody who belongs to God is named. And when he calls me, I'll be somewhere not listening for my number. But for my name. Job says, hide me in the grave. Keep me a secret until your wrath be passed. And then when your wrath is passed, call me and I will answer. Job says, because I'll be listening for my name. He gets them straight about this situation. He gets them straight about this location. And then he works with them on this affirmation that, that Christian hope Listen to me. Christian hope is not merely wishful thinking. But hope is a confident expectation. We do not grieve in the unmitigated manner of the hopeless. For the hopeless, death is a blind alley which leads to a state of nothingness. But for the Christian, death is an open door which leads into everlasting life. For the unbeliever, death is a question mark. But for the child of God, death is an exclamation point. For the unbeliever, death is terrible. But for the child of God, death is a welcome friend. For the unbeliever, death terrifies and frightens. But for the Christian, we are waiting on the day when the Lord himself shall come to get us and bring us back to himself. There will be a resurrection. But not only will there be a resurrection, there will be secondly a rescue. Paul says we will be caught up. That will happen, brothers and sisters, all of a sudden. Caught up. Uh, another word here that was used in the Latin Vulgate, and we use that word now, but it's not in the King James or any of our English translations of the Bible. The word caught up uh, in the Latin Vulgate, which is a, a Roman Catholic translation of the Bible, and that's where we get that word from, because it's the word rapio, from which we get our English word rapture. When we are caught up, we will be raptured. Uh, to be caught up means to snatch away or to seize by force. Uh, when Jesus comes again, it will be a sudden event. The scripture says two people will be working in a field. One of them will disappear and the other will remain. Two people will be sleeping in the bed. One will disappear and the other will remain. That's how quickly we will be caught up. And caught up gives us an idea that he will catch us up and bring us up in the clouds and we'll be in the air. And the scripture says we will be forever in the air with the Lord. But caught up does not mean necessarily in the air. It means to be transposed to another place. To be taken from this world and be brought instantly to another world. It will happen in the blink of an eye. That one minute you are leading a normal life here on earth and the next minute you're in the presence of God. One second you're just washing dishes at the sink and the next second you're in the face of the living God. 
One second you just watching television in the den and the next second you're in heaven with God and all of his saints. Oh, brothers and sisters, you got to be ready because you don't know the day nor the hour when the suddenness of this rescue will occur. But let's I hold you too long this morning. Not only will it be sudden, it'll be selected. Let me see if I can get it over to you like this. Jesus ain't coming for everybody. Uh, we will be caught up. That we are believers. I wish I had a witness here. Uh, um, everybody at the airport is not taking a flight. Everybody who is at who is at Bush Intercontinental or, or Hobby is not there to board a flight. Some people just work at the airport. Uh, some people dropping somebody off at the airport. Or somebody's picking somebody up at the airport. But everybody, just because you're at the airport, don't mean you're getting on a flight. Just because you're at church don't mean you're going back with him when he comes again. Have I got a witness here? You got to belong to him for when he comes back. He's not coming back for anybody who's not a part of the family. He's coming back for the church without a spot or wrinkle. And he will be selective in the people who is going back with him. You must be born again. Uh, it's sudden. It's selective. But I want you to see how sensational this rescue is going to be. The very language of 1 Thessalonians 4 rings with excitement and expectation. Listen to the text. The word says, the Lord himself shall descend with a shout and the voice of an archangel. There are seven archangels that attend the throne of God. Only two of them are named. Michael and Gabriel. Gabriel is the announcing angel. When God got ready to announce the birth of Christ, he sent Gabriel to make that announcement. But when Michael shows up, Michael is always there to tear stuff up. But when Christ comes again, he won't send Gabriel. He won't send Michael. He is going to come himself. Come on, I wish I had one or two more believers here. Uh, in order for you to shout about this, you got, to, you got to know a little bit about what Jewish weddings consisted of. A Jewish wedding had something to do with, first of all, a betrothal. Uh, the, the groom uh, was, a bride was selected for the groom. The father chose a bride for the groom. That was a betrothal. The father chose the bride for his son. Uh, the, the, the bride was selected by the father for the son. Uh, Abraham sent for a wife for Isaac. Uh, uh, the father chose a bride for his son. And then once the arrangement was made, there was a period between the betrothal and the marriage. And in that betrothal period, which was usually a year or so, the groom was getting everything ready for the bride. Uh, he had gone away to prepare everything for his bride. 
making sure that everything was in place, that, that a house was bought, that land was secured, that everything needed to take care of a bride was already provided for. He went away for a while to prepare for his bride. And then when the groom was coming, uh, the bridesmaids played a little game where they filled their lamps with oil because they did not know when the bridegroom was coming because it was their responsibility as bridesmaids to make the bride aware that the groom was coming but to make sure that the way was lighted they had to keep their lamps full of oil somebody ought to help me preach right here <laughs> one day the bridegroom is coming God has already selected a bride for his son and his bride is the church. And one day the bridegroom is coming back. In the meantime, he is somewhere preparing a place for his bride, the church. But it's our responsibility to keep oil in our lamps because we don't know when the bridegroom will arrive. And so I want to keep my lamp trimmed and burning. The oil that's supposed to be in my lamp is not the oil that the bridesmaids had in Matthew's gospel. The oil that he's talking about for us is the Holy Spirit of God that keeps us on fire, that keeps us alive, keeps us active and dynamic and connected to the word so that when we come to worship, all we're saying is, I'm waiting on the bridegroom. I'm waiting on the bridegroom. There will be a resurrection. There will be a rescue. We will be caught up to meet the Lord in the air. But brothers and sisters, thank God, not only will there be a resurrection, and the rescue, there will be a family reunion. They were confused about those who had died in the faith. And they didn't know what was going to happen to believers after death. So Paul got their hope secured that we will not prevent them who are asleep. Can you imagine that? One of these days, graves are going to open up. And people who have died in Christ, their bodies will be reconstituted. Their souls and their spirits knit again with their bodies. No matter if they drowned, they're going to come back together. No matter if they were cremated, every atom, every particle, every chromosome every piece of them no matter if they never found out where they were buried or where their bodies are they will come back together if they love God because we will be caught up to meet the Lord in the air uh, brothers and sisters the dead in Christ are going to rise first and then we who are alive if we are still here and remain, we will be changed. You're going to help me close this, won't you? Paul says in 1 Corinthians, brethren, I, I show you a mystery. I wish I had two or three Bible reading. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye. That's why you ought not fear death because flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Neither does corruption inherit incorruption. I show you, Paul says, a mystery. And listen to me, Lily Grove, mystery, a mystery is not that about which we cannot know anything. A mystery is that about which we cannot know everything. God has kept some secret things for himself. But there are some things God has told us about the resurrection. 
I wish I had one or two more witnesses. He says we ought to be looking for him. We ought to be living for him. And then we ought to be loving the lost to help them to come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. Because one day this mortal must put on immortality. This corruptible must put on incorruption. Then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written. Death shall be swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your sting? O grave, where is your victory? The sting of death is sin. And the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. He's coming back again. I said he's coming back again. To those of us who love God ought to be excited that he's coming back again. One of these days, Jesus, the warrior king Christ, will stand up at the right hand of God with power and wave his hand and swear that time that has been shall be no more. I wish I had one or two more witnesses. And the Bible says the dead in Christ shall rise first. And we who are alive shall be caught up together to meet the Lord in the air. Somebody here like myself got some missing seats at your family table. Somebody's missing at your Thanksgiving table. Somebody's missing at the recliner in your den. Somebody's missing in your family reunion time. But one of these days, we will meet them again. Not at Houston Memorial Gardens. Not at Paradise North or South. But at a sea of glass mingled with fire. Is there anybody here waiting on that great getting up morning? The late Dr. Caesar Clark used to say that revolving planets will leap up on the funeral piers of a smoky judgment day and then Gabriel will sound the judgment alarm and it'll sound so loud it'll wake up the children sleeping it'll wake up my old grandmother it'll wake up my mother and father it'll wake up my brothers and my sisters but I'm going to wake up one of these days because Jesus right now is getting us ready for that great day. Is there anybody here getting ready for that great day? Is there anybody here got some oil in your lamps? Is there anybody here ready for that great day? Well, if you're not ready, let me tell you how to get ready. Because worship and word always go together. And if you know the word, you can shout in the worship. And if you don't know how to shout here, I don't know how you're going to shout over there. I don't understand people. God's been good to you. And you can't open your mouth. God has put food on your table. And you can't tell God, thank you. God opened doors that were closed in your face. And you can't shout hallelujah. If you can't shout right here, I don't know how you're going to shout over there. Because over there, every day is Sunday and the Sabbath has no end. Over there, no goodbyes are said. Over there, no hearse wheels roll. Over there, there's no doctor's appointments. Over there, there's no hospitals and nursing homes. Over there, 
Jesus is waiting on us. Are you ready? I said, are you ready? If God has saved you and you're ready to meet the bridegroom, why don't you get in practice right now? Why don't you start practicing right now? Tell him thank you. Tell him glory. Shout hallelujah. Why don't you get ready right now? Praise God right now. Give him worship right now. Why don't you hug somebody? Why don't you grab your neighbor? Tell him I'm ready for the bridegroom. I'm ready. I'm ready. I know he's all right. Hallelujah. Don't be don't don't be misled by the Jehovah's Witnesses. I would not have you to be ignorant concerning them which are asleep. Jehovah's Witnesses say oh, only 144,000 are going to be in heaven. That's half truth. But half the truth is all of a lie. 144,000 are the 12 tribes of Israel times 12,000 from every tribe. 12 times 12,000 from every tribe of Israel is 144,000 and they will be in heaven. But John said, I saw another number. That, that no man could number. Coming from the north and the south. From the east and the west. And they had on white robes. And his name was written in their forehead. And he said, I asked the elder, who are they? And the elder said, these are they. Who have come through the tribulation. And they have washed their robes white in the blood of the Lamb. They have been redeemed. 